Mike? Are you guys setting it up? Yeah. All right, cool. Let's try. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Okay. For okay. Now you can open. Good job. <laughs> All right. So this should be hopefully easy. Oh gosh. Sorry. <laughs> it's for Andrew. <laughs> okay. I know he's gonna be at a wedding and he's gonna be like, oh, it's time to dance. <laughs> All right. So we will give you a couple minutes. You can do it in groups of three or four. Lesion of the right dorsal column at L1 would lead to what impairment? You don't have to tell me exactly the muscles. You can give me general picture. Somatosensory is kind of icky. <laughs> Let's go on beyond somatosensory. Because it's not all somatosensory, is it? Um, okay, yeah. so is it more like the pressure, discriminative touch, and vibration? Yes, and it's not the, what's the other somatic sensation that it's not? The pain and temperature. Exactly. So it's the discriminative touch, it's the um, deep pressure, it's proprioception, it's vibration because that's what's carried by the doors calm. Why did you say it was on um, the right? Because it doesn't cross. Or after the, it's already crossed. <laughs> Has it crossed yet? It's coming in from the right, going up the right. It hasn't crossed yet. Right. Correct. It's right. Yes. It hasn't crossed yet. It's still on the right. I was yesterday driving with my daughter, and I'm like, OK, go to the left. Oh, no, go to the right. And I'm like, and she goes all the way to the left lane, and I'm like, it would be the other right. <laughs> so we were stuck having a... All right. So then you, when you get this, you can click. So damage to the right dorsal column is absence of what you said, discriminative touch or two-point discrimination, deep pressure, vibration, and position sensation or proprioception in the right leg. And um, so this would be fasciculus gracilis because that's all that is there at L1. So... Uh, would that be like Brown Sequard syndrome? No, no, that'd be all of them. That yeah, but that's a good. Column. We're gonna. That's so like. Yeah, you're in the right. It's part of Brown Sequard. But here's our lesion. So you see the pick comes. So here's my right dorsal column. So information can come in through the first order neuron, but then and but then it's the first order neuron that's actually getting lesion as after the dorsal root ganglia as it goes up. Because where does this guy get a synapse? <laughs> well, that's the nucleus gracilis, and then it then its axon would be the medial lemniscus. Okay, so so this is just another viewpoint. Again, what we're talking about is a right dorsal column lesion. So if it were brown saccard, it would be all of this. So we would also have pain and temperature. We would also, on the other side, we might get to that one. Shh. And that would affect everything below L1? Yes, right. exactly. So we're expecting basically lower extremity loss of proprioception, two-point discrimination, um, vibration, and deep pressure. On the right, because it hasn't crossed. 
yet. Okay. Okay, here's the next one. Lesion of the right lateral corticospinal tract at L1 produces what impairment? So, take a couple no, minutes. This is really voluntary movement. Yep. Yeah, but like at this point you can. Yeah, so lower extremity. This is voluntary on the right lower extremity. So um, why is it on the right? So it's already crossed. So where, where is the origin of the yeah. neurons in this corticospinal tract, the nuclei of the, the precentral gyrus on where? The cortex. Left or right? The left. left. So it started up here, okay, on my left precentral gyrus. That's my nucleus. Comes down my corticospinal tract, crosses in my medulla at the parietal decusation, and then travels down the right side of my spinal cord. I lesioned my right side of my spinal cord, so all those axons are not able to reach the lower motor neurons below L1. And so that's when they're out to party, right? So. Uh -oh. So is the lesion at L1 and below, or just below? <coughs> it's at L1 and below. Um, so, again, at L1 causes upper motor neuron signs, which is weakness or paralysis, depending on the extent, hyperreflexia, hypertonicity or spasticity, you could say clonus and Babinski in the right lower extremity. 
is Babinski the same thing as you're saying at Clonus? Like, no. Um, the Babinski is when you stroke oh, yeah. the bottom of the okay. foot. Sorry. Clonus is when you see that it's basically, the Clonus is a hyperreflexia. I mean, it's basically where you have just a very light touch and it elicits a, a stretch reflex. So you almost always see it when someone just taps. You know, the most common is their wheelchair foot plates when they're going down a curb or something. So you can have a positive Babinski, but not you could theoretically, but not really. I mean, they almost always have both. Did you have a question? Yeah. Well, it's going to, those, that corticospinal tract has upper motor neurons that are going to synapse at L1, at L2, depending on wherever. And so, yes, those will be lower motor neurons. Why would we not, this is a really important question, why would we not see it as a lower motor neuron deficit? You might see it a little tiny bit, but it's going to be very hard to detect. Because it has an exit to the spinal cord yet? Well, it has an exit to the spinal cord yet, that's true. But in order to have a lower motor neuron deficit, what would I have to injure? The ventral horn. The ventral horn, the entire spinal cord ventral horn. I didn't do that. I just cut L1, right? Everything below L1, that ventral horn, is it OK? Are all those roots as they leave OK? They're totally fine. So in order to get a lower motor neuron lesion, I have to either damage a peripheral nerve, a spinal root, or I have to have some disease that causes degeneration of the ventral horn. Because otherwise, I'd have to take the ice pick and go straight down just through my ventral horn, which will never happen. That would be really, that'd be like pissing a frog. Remember that? Anybody have to do that? Nobody had to do the sciatic nerve experiment? You did, yeah. So you pissed the frog. It's disgusting, isn't it? It's a horrible, horrible. But you basically, it's just not nice. But anyhow, um, and the only disease that really is just lower motor neuron where it actually causes degeneration of the anterior horn is polio. So hopefully you don't see that. That's kind of where we hope the vaccines work. Um, all right, so here we are. Again, we're going to get our knife coming in or our pick going to the right lateral corticospinal tract. So as the upper motor neuron comes down, here's its cell body and the cortex crosses at the medulla up. We're going to not be able to reach all those lower motor neurons beyond uh, below it. So all those lower motor neurons below L1, what are they free to do? Party on their own. They have nobody to control them. So here's the cross-section of the spinal cord. Again, we've gotten the right lateral corticospinal tract. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we good? We're going to go on this easy, and then we'll get into some cases. These are easy. Let's try this one. Lesion of the right lateral spinal thalamic tract at L1. We're being consistent now. We've gotten a different tract. So I'll give you a couple minutes. Okay. 
Misty. We got Misty. I'm getting all this side of it. Mix it up. What do you think? Okay, so left, lower extremity, loss of pain and temperature. And I should say that crude, you know, we call it pain and temperature, but it really is crude touch um, is what we're talking about as well. So it's discriminative for the dorsal columns and it's crude. So when you actually just say, can you feel this, and you're just doing a quick little screen, which one are you screening? You're doing both. With just the quick little screen, it's both. And so then if you have a deficit, then you might have to figure out which one it is. I thought, um, I thought spinal thalamic was at the level, like it's going to be at the level, maybe just one or two above. No. That's a good point. How, how would that happen? This is all below. This is all below the lesion because um, this is the track. How would we get just at the level? The anterior white commissure. Because those are the fibers just at that level. So um, you said on the left, right? <laughs> Correct. Um, Why did you say on the left? It has crossed. Where, what happens with this with the spinal thalamic? When does it cross? Pretty much right away. It comes into the spinal cord, goes up and down a couple, and probably with with this deficit, you might actually see some trunk loss too, because remember that that entrance is very diffuse as, in, as far as where it actually synapses. So. Um, so it's contralateral, oopsie. So it's going to, again, you've got the um, pain and temperature, really crude touch on the left leg. And again, remember the, the, here's our lesion. So here's our intralateral or spinal thalamic tract. These are the fibers that, again, have basically <laughs> it comes in, synapses, crosses over, and then travels up here. So it's already crossed. So this information came from the contralateral side of the body. Did that same question have been asked, only the lesion was in the anterior white commissioner, you would say that it would be loss of that at the same level? No, is there On which side of the body? On the both sides. Both sides. Both sides. On the both sides of the body, yes. <laughs> exactly. So if I were to, and we will have something similar like that. <laughs> so. All right. Um. All right, wait a minute. Now you're, you're ruining the party. We have to escape because it can't go that way. Now, just making it not fun. Close your eyes. Everybody close. We're having bi-temporal, bi-nasal hemianopsias. All right, now you can open. Oh, well, you don't see anything anyhow. <laughs> Why is it up there and not here? Oh, okay. Complete transection of the lateral corticospinal, lateral spinal thalamic, with sparing of the dorsal columns bilaterally would produce what impairments? In the cervical region, sorry. bilateral spinal thalamic, dorsal columns are okay in the cervical region. Issues on both sides. 
group for help. Um, <laughs> okay, so it would be you would lose everything from that loved one down, right? Besides what's carried in the dorsal columns. Yeah, so you gave me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you lose everything but the dorsal columns. That's what that says. <laughs> Tell me what everything is. Tell me about your clinical exam. What do you see in this patient? What's everything? Uh, spasticity, paralysis from the neck down. Okay. Um, positive Klebinski and clonus. Right, so no voluntary movement, yeah. exactly. Okay, They're so. They're able to feel deep pressure. Uh huh. What else are they able to feel? Proprioc proprioception, um, deep pressure, <laughs> vibration, <laughs> two point discrimination. Right, so they have, they have discriminative touch. They have um, proprioception, so they know where their arms and legs are. But they can't move them. They can't move them. What else can't they do? Sounds miserably. Um, <laughs> it is miserable. Well, you have like loss of what was it? Pain, pain, pain and, and temperature. Up? No. no still Everything's down. Yep. Because the interlateral tracts, they're traveling up, so basically everything below that lesion isn't going to reach the cortex. And dorsal columns, they're spared. Why are they spared? Why would this happen? Oh, we Go thought it would be the, the spinal artery, the anterior spinal Exactly, and that's exactly, because remember, it, it supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord, everything, but um, the dorsal columns, this is the anterior cord syndrome, which is basically a bleed or, an, or a um, embolism of the anterior spinal artery. So you got lateral corticospinal tracts bilaterally, so that's why you had loss of voluntary movement, you had spasticity, you had clonus. Um, I'll get you to one second. And then you had also bilaterally below the lesion, you lost pain and temperature, and that's because of the um, spinal thalamic tracts bilaterally. And position sense was spared, discriminative touch was spared. Yep. Um, when, like, looking at the question and then this picture. We're going to do that next, yeah. Is like is the anterior is that like the horn part just like a moot point at that point just like you didn't include. oh I see you mean the dorsal horns yeah um they they're they're also theoretically supplied but it's going to be just at that level see that's the problem is the dorsal horns and the ventral horns those are what nuclei or axons those are nuclei so yes you might have a sensory loss of discriminative touch and all, all that at the level lesion. How easy do you think that would be able to detect? Just at L1 in a little tiny bit. You're probably not, that's like, yes, you probably are going to damage when you have a transection of the spinal cord, you are going to damage the ventral horn at that lesion. So you might have a, a, a zone of hyporeflexia followed by lots of hyperreflexia. You may not, depending on how, what, how large that lesion is. So, and the same thing, you might lose discriminative touch, just, but it's gonna be so hard to detect. Which the ventral cords are involved too? 
um, yeah, they're supplied as well. But again, it's going to be hard to detect, really, loss of one level of anterior horn cells. So here's our lesion. <laughs> so we've got our lateral corticospinal tracts. Go, go, go. The upper motor neuron is going to not be able to reach its lower motor neuron. That's why we have um, the spasticity, clonus, hyperreflexia. And here's the um, spinothalamic tracts from one side going down. And then we're obviously going to have the other side as well. And it all will happen. All right, so that's, and then here's our picture like you, what you were talking about, is essentially we are supplying all of this. So yes, you do lose the ventral horns and you do lose the, some of the dorsal horns, but you're not going to detect it because it's just one small layer of cells. What you're really going to detect is all those axons who can't reach the lower motor neurons below and all those axons that can't reach the cortex above. Okay. I'm going to try this one. We're going to take a little different, different a path here. So your patient presents with flailing movements of his left extremities. These movements are involuntary. Strength is relatively normal and sensations intact. Muscle tone and reflexes also intact. What might explain this? more specific than that. Oh. <laughs> what, what part of the basal ganglia? Cause, what, what type of movements are these? Hemiballistic. Hemiballistic. These are large flailing movements. They're not just little, because you could say right basal ganglia and I could expect a little resting tremor. This is not a little resting tremor, right? If it was a resting tremor, where would it be? Substantial. Substantial. That's not here. Subthalamic nucleus, exactly. So, yeah. So this is a sub, and I purposely got it out of the spinal cord just to kind of make sure that you weren't, you know, losing the forest. All right. Is that a pyramidal lesion or an extra pyramidal lesion? Lesion of the anterior gray and white commissure, it's also the anterior white commissure, which is early central cord syndrome at C5 and C6 produces what, or C5 to C6 produces what impairment? Uh, 
I know he does not have a I'll scream it. I'll scream it. How does he get a dentist? Well, that's what I'm saying. If he doesn't have a dentist, he's not supposed to So he's got to have it. Are we ready? All right, we've got Paige. <laughs> Is that bad? Where? What side of the bilaterally? So, because this is where the anterolateral fibers are coming in and crossing. So this would be just at the level of the lesion, you know, about the level of the lesion, and it would be bilateral. So this is early central cord syndrome. Um, basically, um, with central cord, so we, you've got this. With central cord syndrome, the most common mechanism is your little old lady who falls, and she has a hyperflexion or a hyperextension injury of the neck and loses blood supply to the center of the cord. That's the most common reason. The other big reason is the formation of a syrinx around the central canal, and that also is most commonly at the cervical level. What's it called when we have that the pocket of CSF? Myelia. What's it called in the brainstem? Bulbia. Syringobulbia. So um, either way, we're basically damaging the central center part of the cord and it can expand. So the first thing it's going to get are those fibers that carry pain and temperature that are just entering the spinal cord. So that means everything below is fine, everything above is fine. So here's early central cord syndrome. Again, we're getting those fibers just around the central canal. Now, so pain and temperature is not going to be able to get to those bilateral regions. They call this um, a cape-like distribution of sensory loss because it's like you're wearing a cape. Now our central cord is going to explode. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's it, the, the thing about central cord is it's a very, very unique presentation because in all of our other spinal cord injuries, when the upper extremities are involved, what else is involved? The lower, everything below the lesion. But now we've got the upper extremities involved, but the lower extremities are perfectly fine. Okay? So now our central cord um, syndrome has expanded. Okay? So now we have full central cord. So it's gone beyond the anterior gray and white commissures, and it's gone into the regions lateral to that. So what would happen?
We ready? This is hard. So we've got Nick. Great. Great. What do you think? Um, well, we were going with that they will have the hand temperature at the level of the region bilaterally and be impaired. And then voluntary movement bilaterally at the level and below. Okay, why? Because you're damaging the entire region and that would be the core of the spinal tract. Okay, so if it actually had to get all the way through the corticospinal tracts, if it, we'd have to get all of the corticospinal tracts for that to happen, right? That's, now we've gotten all the way to the edges of the lateral columns. That would be like death. That would be bad. Um, so it doesn't go that far, but your thinking's right. Um, so basically what you're going to end up with is you are going to have upper motor neuron signs at the level of the lesion, basically in the upper extremities. Why? It doesn't get the entire corticospinal tract, but it ends up with upper extremity. Because it's somatotopically organized. And so the most medial portions of those corticospinal tracts are, are to the cervical lower motor neurons, so to the upper extremities. So, and then it obviously goes thoracic, lumbar, and sacral as we work our way laterally. So because of the somatotopic organization of the corticospinal tracts, you end up, again, with a very strange presentation. You lose pain and temperature, and you lose um, voluntary movement. You have spasticity and everything. Everything's in the upper extremities. Lower extremities are fine. So what would be wrong you wrong with the lower extremity because you didn't see how far lateral it goes? Um, it is wrong. Um, because then you'd have to have a lesion that would actually expand the whole spinal cord, and that's why I, I, this is called central cord, so you just need to know what central cord is. But I would purposely didn't tell you in advance, so I want to see if you guys would figure out that you lose the upper extremities, and it, it, theoretically, yes, if it would just keep expanding and the searings would take over your entire spinal cord, that would be really, really bad. So as soon as someone loses pain and temperature, just in the upper extremities bilaterally, hopefully they're either shunting the searing or they're stabilizing the neck so that they Sorry. don't lose motor function. But you know it progressed as they start to see upper motor neuron signs. But you'd see them in the arms. We were thinking more like the interlateral horn. It would but where are they? T well, T1 to L2. T2 right, to L2. And, and our lesion is C5, C6. So they don't even run through that high? Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't, they're not even present until the until T1. Okay. Mm -hmm. What if we did that? At now they're pretty far lateral. Well, they're not that far. So yeah, that if 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 for some reason they were up there, yeah, if you had like a thoracic. But then again, if you think about just the mechanism of injury, it's going to be cervical, and searings very rarely happen below the cervical level. So central cord is almost always, and it's just a classic person comes in upper extremity involvement, no lower extremity involvement, pain and temperature loss, proprioception mm -hmm. intact. And it's bilateral. So it was. It was that was a little tricky on purpose. So um, and I can't tell you why exactly. You know, you you could have said, well, why doesn't it work its way up to some of the dorsal columns, or why doesn't it work its way that way? It just goes straight laterally. I have no idea. You know why? You know, it's certainly for the vascular component. I can explain it, but not for the central canal, not for searing, it's why it always happens this way. What happens if you just damage your central canal? Damaging a hole? Yeah, I don't know. If you just damage a hole, it's already a hole. Well, it's on your Yeah, it's on the... I'm asking for the... Oh, oh, I know, I didn't, I know, okay. you're right. Uh, I posted the answers, I didn't put an answer there, because obviously... Okay. There were a few of those, easier. like a sulcus. Okay. Yeah, I just, I should have put... N A N A N A. Okay, I there's no answer on those. Like Wait, is not doing it too I know, but I I posted them so they would come up right when. Oh. Yeah, don't panic. <laughs> I made it like if it's due at eight, it comes up at eight thirty, something like that. So you would have them.
there's no there's no answer to that. There's no answer to the salt guy getting damaged. The only one I argued was I did make an argument that, and I wouldn't do this on a test, but just to make you think in the assignment, the ventral median fissure, what is located there? The anterior spinal artery. So if if I had said damage to something in this spot, but you know if you damage a sulcus or a hole. Okay, good. That sounds like cerebral spinal fluid issues. No, I, I should have put NA in the chart, but uh, all right. All right, here we go. I know you guys wanted this one. Complete chin section of the right half of the spinal cord, which is hemicord syndrome or brown saccard at L1, produces what impairments?